at this Advent and Christmas time, it's a, it's a good time to stop and reflect on our lives. What am I investing in? Is it lasting? Does it even have eternal value? And so we can stop and reflect. I read recently about a town, Gaffley, Sweden, where they build every year a, a, a goat made of straw. And this goat is about two stories tall, and uh, they've been doing this for 50 years every year at Christmas time. It's their Christmas goat. But 35 times out of the 50 years, somebody has come and burned it to the ground. And each year they build it up again. And in the last few years, they put security cameras on it. They've had a security guard. But then when the security guard steps away to go to the men's room, somebody comes along and burns it to the ground again. And yet they keep building it every single year. They could build it out of things which would last, but they keep building it out of straw. And so I think when I, when I read that, it caused me to think, what am I building out of straw? What are we building out of straw? Are we building on the things that will last? Advent is a time. Christmas is a time. Even this COVID-19 period is a time where we can reflect on our lives. In what am I putting my energy and my strength and my uh, mental uh, activity? Is it something that's going to last? Is it, does it have eternal value? Now at Advent, we talk about light. It's the season of light. And that's because God is light. The Bible says in 1 John, God is light and in him there is no darkness at all. And so Advent and Christmas is all about this God of light, who is the essence of light, who has come into our world in our Lord Jesus Christ. We need light. We know that we need light physically. Uh, There was a man many years ago in the 1960s, Michael Seffrey, He was a French geologist, and he uh, wanted to run an experiment to test out what would happen to people if they were in isolation. And so he gathered a group of people, and he put them in various caves, uh, individually in a cave. Uh, His uh, team would come and, and see how they're doing every day. They were given one light bulb that would go on in the morning when they awakened and go off at night when they went to sleep. And they were supposed to be there for many, many months. And when they finally got done with the experiment, uh, the people were surprised it was done so soon. What had happened was being in the dark for so long and not having enough light, it warped their sense of time. And so more than just learning about isolation, what Sefri learned was about our body clock, how our body clock has a 24-hour cycle. And when we don't get enough light, it interrupts that 24-hour cycle. And and it causes many, many problems in our life. It's why, for example, we've learned that people who live in in places where there's a lot of snow in the Midwest or in the East and in other parts of the world, they suffer from seasonal affective disorder, SAD for short. And it causes them to uh, gain weight and be depressed and have a whole host of problems. 6% of Americans suffer from this problem in the wintertime. Why? Because our bodies, our mind, our brain needs light. We know that we need light. In fact, they've even found that uh, people are more inclined to lie, cheat, and steal in the dark than in the light. We even know that students, for example, in a classroom, if a student is sitting in the back of the class in an area that's dark, he won't test as well as the student who's sitting by the window. And so we were designed by the God of heaven and earth to have light. Light comes in the morning and it wakes our brain and it wakes up our body so that we can go on with the activities of our day. Now, if this is true for us physically, how much more is it true for us spiritually? The God who made us physically is the same God who made us spiritually and and gave us a soul. And our soul is meant to have light. Let's take a look at a Bible passage. Turn with me to the Gospel of John, the first chapter and the fourth and fifth verse. In him was life, and the life was the light of all people. The light shines in the darkness, and the darkness did not overcome it. In him is life. The apostle John who writes these words uses this word 35 times in the gospel of John, and he uses the verb to live 15 times, all in a book that has 21 chapters. And the word that he uses here for life, he could have used the Greek word bio, which means just to exist. But instead, he uses the Greek word zoe, 
which means a full and rich and meaningful life. Jesus uses the same word in John chapter 10, verse 10, when he says, I have come that they might have life and have it abundantly. The word he uses again is Zoe, that they might have an abundant life. And so in our Lord Jesus Christ, he comes and brings his life to us. Life is something which is positive and uplifting. He brings life, not destruction, not chaos, but he brings life. Look at what St. Augustine, the church father, said about this. He says, oh God, you have made us for yourself, and our hearts are restless until they find their rest in you. Yes, we find life in him. Not just an existence, but a life that's full and rich and meaningful. He comes and brings his life into our world and into our lives. And the text says, as a result, there is light in the world. Because Jesus has come with his life, there is now light in our world. And we need this light. Light brings so many things. It brings emotional and spiritual wholeness to us and health to us. And then it says, this light has come for the, the whole world, for all people, it says. The light has come for all people, not just believers, but for all people. Now, that's a pretty audacious statement to make, unless it's true. Jesus comes to bring light to everyone. In fact, it's probably one of the reasons why even non-believers celebrate Christmas, because his light has penetrated every soul to some degree. His light has affected every aspect of our world. His light has come into the world for all people. And then it says it shines in the darkness. Now, if you have a Bible in front of you, I want you to take a a pencil or a pen and take a look at that word shines and circle the S on the end because it will help you remember that that verb is a present tense verb. It means it's not only, happen, not only happened in the past, but it is happening even now and will continue to happen forever. Now, you can't say that about other historical figures. If you speak of a historical figure like, let's say, Abraham Lincoln, you talk about the impact he has made on our country and on the world, how he ended slavery through the Emancipation Proclamation, you always have to speak in the past tense. Or if you speak of Martin Luther King and you speak of the great advances that he made in civil rights for our nation, you still have to speak of him and what he did in the past tense. Only Jesus can be talked about in the present tense because he is alive, he has conquered the grave, and he is present with us in this moment now and forevermore. His light continues to shine. It shines on. It's a present tense reality. And then it says it shines in the darkness and the darkness could not overcome it. The darkness could not overcome it. You know, on the night in which Jesus was betrayed and crucified, I'm sure the disciples thought that the world, that darkness had, had, had conquered the world. I'm sure they thought that, they, that the light had lost and darkness had won. They were in hiding in the upper room after his crucifixion. And the Bible records that when Mary Magdalene went to the tomb of Jesus, she went early in the morning, and then the text says, while it was still dark. As if to say that was our mood, that was our attitude, that was our outlook at that point. Darkness had won. But then Jesus conquers the grave and proves again and again that the light he brings into the world can never be extinguished. The light he brings into the world can never be covered. The light light that he brings into the world will always be bright and it shines on forevermore. Maybe you've heard somebody say sometime that somebody is a lost cause or Something is a lost cause. Or you talk about somebody throwing in the towel and giving up. There are people who quit quite easily. They give up on on their marriage. They give up on their career. They give up on their job. They go from job to job to job because they're always giving up. And perhaps in the back of our mind, because we've given up on things from time to time, we think that maybe God will do the same, that maybe he will give up on us. And yet this text reminds us that his light shines in the darkness and he will never give up on you. His light will never go out. He'll never stop working at redeeming and restoring us. 
His love will continue on forever and ever. His light shines on, and the darkness could not overcome it. I remember back in July of 1969, I I was sitting with my parents in our family home, watching as millions around the world were watching as the, as the spacecraft, the lunar module, was descending down on the moon for the first time in the history of the world. Neil Armstrong and Buzz Aldrin were going to step out onto the planet surface of the moon. And we were on the edge of our seats. And Neil Armstrong stepped on the moon and said, there's one small step for a man, one giant leap for mankind. They planted the flag on the moon, and now we were concerned and worried, will they be able to lift off and go back to the command module and return to Earth? We prayed and hoped, and certainly it all worked out. What we didn't know at that time was that there was a man by the name of William Sapphire who worked in the White House for President Nixon. He was a speechwriter. Before they had even left to go to the moon, he had been given a a responsibility and a task. And that was to write a speech for President Nixon that he would give to the nation if the men never returned. Imagine going on a mission so serious and so dangerous that they write your obituary before you even leave. Well, guess what? It's happened once before. Fortunately, that speech was never given. But there's been another announcement long before that God himself would come in Jesus and die on a cross. That's what the prophets like Isaiah wrote about. That's what the angel was saying to Mary. That's what the angel said to the the young shepherd boys in the hillside. That's what the Bethlehem star was announcing, that a Savior had come, a Messiah had come, and he had come to die for you and for me, but that that death would not hold him because his light shines on, and he was raised from the dead so that we might have eternal life that we might have abundant life. And so as we experience this Christmas, be reminded that we invest not in temporal things, not in uh, things built on straw. We invest rather in things that have eternal value. Our Lord Jesus Christ, who is the light of the world, his light will shine in your life. No matter what you're going through this day, just remember His light will never go out, and it will always illuminate your path. Let's pray together. Jesus, we thank you that you are the light of the world. You've come into the world, and you've illuminated our lives. Remind us, no matter how dark it might be for us right now, that your light is still shining, and you will see us through. So bless us, Lord, on this Christmas, this Advent season, as we lead up to Christmas. Give us your blessing and give us your light. In Jesus' name, amen.